To understand the hand, we'll begin by looking at the bones and joints. Then we'll look at some important pulleys, and then we'll see the muscles. After that, we'll add the vessels and nerves, and lastly, we'll look at the skin. The terms that we'll use for orientation are ulnar and radial for the sides of the hand, radial being the side with the thumb, and palmar and dorsal for the front and the back. To begin looking at the bones and joints of the hand, let's see what they're called. Here are the eight carpal bones, and here are the five metacarpals. Each finger has a proximal phalanx, a middle phalanx, and a distal phalanx. The thumb just has two phalanges, a proximal phalanx and a distal phalanx. The joints of the hand have long names. The joints between the carpus and the metacarpals are the carpometacarpal joints. The joints between the metacarpals and the proximal phalanges are the metacarpophalangeal joints. The joints between the phalanges are the interphalangeal joints, proximal and distal. We'll often refer to these joints as CMC joints, MP joints, and IP joints for short. To look in some detail at the bones and joints of the hand, we'll look first at the carpus, then at the four fingers with their metacarpals, then at the thumb with its metacarpal. We saw the individual names of the carpal bones in the previous section. Let's look at their overall shape. There are two bony projections on each side. On the ulnar side, the pisiform bone, and this part of the hamate, called the hook. On the radial side, the tubercle of the scaphoid, and the crest of the trapezium. With these projections, the bones of the carpus form the base and the side walls of a space called the carpal tunnel. Here's how the carpus looks in the living body. The radiocarpal and midcarpal joints are hidden by the heavy capsular ligaments. Here are those four projections again, the tubercle of the scaphoid, the crest of the trapezium, the pisiform, and the hook of the hamate. And here's the carpal tunnels, still without its roof. Now let's move on to look at the metacarpals of the four fingers and at their CMC joints. Here are the carpometacarpal joints. The bases of the four finger metacarpals, tightly packed together, articulate here with the distal row of carpal bones. The base of the first metacarpal, the one for the thumb, articulates separately here with the trapezium. These four carpometacarpal joints only allow a small amount of movement. The fifth metacarpal is the most mobile, the fourth is less so, the third hardly moves at all, and neither does the second. When the CMC joints are flexed, the metacarpal heads lie in a curve. This strong ligament is the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. It keeps the metacarpal heads of the four fingers from spreading apart. As it crosses each MP joint, the ligament is continuous with a structure that we'll meet shortly, the palmar plate. Since it doesn't connect to the first metacarpal, the ligament doesn't prevent movement of the thumb away from the hand. Next, we'll move on to the bones and joints of the fingers themselves. The proximal and middle phalanges are flattened on their flexor aspects. The flexor tendons run along here. The sheath that surrounds the flexor tendons is attached to these ridges. The tip of the distal phalanx is flattened. The fibrous pulp of the fingertip is attached here. The bed of the fingernail is attached here. Now let's look at the metacarpophalangeal joint, the MP joint. It's the joint at which the finger becomes separate from the hand. We'll take the other fingers away so that we can see it from all sides. The articular surface of the metacarpal head is curved in two planes, from side to side and from front to back. The base of the proximal phalanx has a concave articular surface that's also curved in two planes. The shape of the bones allows a wide range of flexion and extension at the MP joints.
It also allows a range of side-to-side -side movement that's greater when the joints are extended, less when they're flexed. We'll see why that is in a minute. Let's see what the joint looks like in the living body. The MP joint has a capsule that's loose on the back to allow the joint to flex. On the front, the capsule thickens remarkably into a tough piece of fibrocartilage, the palmar plate, also called the palmar ligament. The palmar plate moves along with the proximal phalanx when the joint flexes. Here's the palmar plate incised to show how thick it is. As we'll see, some important structures are attached to the palmar plate or merge with it. One of them we've seen already, the deep transverse metacarpal ligament. It goes here. Here, we've removed most of the joint capsule so that we can see the two massive collateral ligaments which hold the MP joint together. The collateral ligaments run obliquely from the back of the metacarpal head to the front of the base of the proximal phalanx. The collateral ligaments are loose when the joint is extended, but when it's flexed, they become tight. So when the joint is extended, side-to-side -side movement can occur readily, but when the joint is flexed, the tightness of the ligaments prevents side-to-side -side movement. We need to understand the names that are given to those side-to-side -side movements at the MP joints. Spreading all the fingers apart is called abduction. Bringing them all together is adduction. Those are useful terms for describing those collective movements of the fingers. But when we're speaking of an individual finger, it's often simpler to speak instead of ulnar deviation and radial deviation. Now let's move on to the interphalangeal joints. The proximal and distal IP joints are very much alike. They're different from the MP joints in that they only allow flexion and extension. The head of the phalanx is curved mainly from front to back, with a slight depression in the middle. The base of the adjoining phalanx has a corresponding curve to it. The capsule of an IP joint is much like that of an MP joint. But the collateral ligaments are different in that they're equally tight in flexion and in extension. Now let's move on from the fingers to look at the bones and joints of the thumb. The first carpometacarpal joint is the joint which gives the thumb its special position and a great deal of its special mobility. Let's take off the metacarpal heads to see the joint surfaces. Here's the first CMC joint. It sits in front of these other CMC joints and at an angle to them. Because of this, the thumb and its metacarpal lie in front of the fingers and their metacarpals. Because of the angle of the carpometacarpal joint, the thumb faces not forward as the fingers do, but sideways across the hand. The articular surface on the trapezium is curved in two planes, from side to side and from back to front. The base of the first metacarpal is curved in the same way. The shape of the joint surfaces enables the first metacarpal to move in this plane and in this plane. We'll name those movements in a minute, but first let's look briefly at the other two joints of the thumb. The MP joint of the thumb is unlike the finger MP joints. It's much more like an interphalangeal joint. It permits only flexion and extension. On its flexor aspect, there are two tiny sesamoid bones, which are embedded in the joint capsule. The one interphalangeal joint of the thumb is just like the IP joints of the fingers. Now, let's go back to the CMC joint and see how the first metacarpal moves and what the movements are called. Movement away from the second metacarpal is called abduction. Movement toward it is adduction. Movements at right angles to this axis are called flexion and extension. These two sets of movements often happen in combination. As it makes these movements, the first metacarpal also rotates around its own long axis 
as the pen is doing. When it's abducted and flexed, it rotates medially. When it's adducted and extended, it rotates laterally. This rotation can't happen in isolation, but only as part of those other bigger movements. It happens because of the curious and complex shape of the CMC joint surfaces. This important and complex movement of the thumb is called opposition. It's a combination of abduction, flexion, and medial rotation, all occurring here at the CMC joint. Because of the rotation that occurs, the tip of the thumb ends up pointing toward the fingers. Once the thumb is in opposition, flexion at the MP and IP joints brings the tip of the thumb into contact with the fingers. We've looked at the bones and joints of the hand and at the movements they're capable of. Before we move on to look at the muscles which move the fingers and thumb and the tendons by which they act, there are a number of important pulleys and sliding structures that we need to understand. These structures guide the direction of pull of the tendons as they cross the wrist joint and pass along the fingers. We'll look first at the two big pulleys at the wrist, the flexor retinaculum and the extensor retinaculum. Here's the flexor retinaculum. It's a tough, unyielding strap of fibrous tissue. The flexor retinaculum is the structure that forms the roof of the carpal tunnel. It's attached on the radial side to the scaphoid and the trapezium, and on the ulnar side to the pisiform bone and the hook of the hamate. As we'll see, the median nerve and all the flexor tendons to the fingers and thumb go through the carpal tunnel. The flexor retinaculum branches off in two places, here and here, to enclose two small separate tunnels. This one on the radial side encloses the tendon of flexor carpi radialis. This one, superficial and on the ulnar side, encloses the ulnar artery and nerve. We'll be returning to the flexor retinaculum later to look at some important structures that arise from it the palmar aponeurosis, and some of the thenar and hypothenar muscles. Let's go around now to the dorsal aspect of the wrist to see the other big pulley, the extensor retinaculum. It runs obliquely from this ridge on the radius to the ulnar styloid, the triquetrum, and the hamate. The extensor retinaculum has a number of deep extensions which are attached to the underlying radius. These divide the space under the retinaculum into several small separate tunnels. All three wrist extensors and all the extensor tendons to the fingers and thumb pass under the extensor retinaculum. Now let's look at the structures in the fingers and in the thumb which hold the flexor and extensor tendons in place, allow them to move and guide their direction of pull. In each finger, this structure, the flexor tendon sheath, provides the two flexor tendons with a smoothly lined, tightly enclosing tunnel to run in. The sheath starts just proximal to the MP joint and extends all the way to the distal phalanx. To see the sheath better, we'll divide it. Parts of the sheath are thick and fibrous, and parts of it are thin and collapsible. On this finger, we'll remove the thin parts of the sheath and just leave the thick parts. These act as pulleys for the flexor tendons, as we'll see. At each joint, the sheath is attached to the edge of the palmar plate. Between the joints, the sheath is attached along each phalanx. The floor of the tunnel for the flexor tendons is formed by the palmar plates and by the smooth, flattened surfaces of the phalanges. The thumb has a similar flexor tendon sheath for its one long flexor tendon. The arrangement for the extensor tendon is entirely different and quite complex. On each finger, the extensor tendon and the tendons of three intrinsic muscles come together to form a structure called the extensor mechanism. Let's take a look at it. We'll look at the muscles themselves a little later. So that we can see the extensor mechanism from all sides, 
We'll look at one finger in isolation. Here's the extensor tendon approaching the back of the MP joint. Here, both on the radial side and on the ulnar side, is the tendon of one of the interosseous muscles. In addition, here, on the radial side only, is the tendon of a lumbrical muscle. On each side, a triangular sheet of tendinous tissue fans out and connects the extensor tendon to the interosseous tendon. This triangular sheet is called the extensor hood. The big extensor tendon divides into three slips over the proximal phalanx. The central slip crosses the proximal IP joint and inserts here on the base of the middle phalanx. The slips on each side fuse with the interosseous tendon to form the two lateral bands. The lateral bands join together over the middle phalanx and insert here on the base of the distal phalanx. The thumb doesn't have such a complex extensor mechanism. The insertion of its two extensor tendons is relatively simple, as we'll see. One last structure to look at before we move on to muscles is the palmar fascia, or palmar aponeurosis. It's a dense triangular sheet of fibrous tissue which covers the middle part of the palm of the hand. Proximally, it's continuous with the flexor retinaculum and with the tendon of palmaris longus. Distally, it separates into slips which insert into the edges of the palmar plates of the MP joints. The palmar fascia protects the underlying nerves, tendons and vessels from harm. The skin of the palm of the hand is firmly attached to it. Now that we've looked at the bones, joints and pulleys of the hand, we're almost ready to see the muscles. Before we do that, let's review what we've seen so far. Here are the carpal bones, the metacarpals, the proximal phalanges, middle phalanges, and distal phalanges, the carpometacarpal joints, the MP joints of the fingers, the proximal IP joints, the distal IP joints, on the thumb, the MP joint, and the IP joint. Here's the flexor retinaculum and the side tunnel for the ulnar nerve. The extensor retinaculum, the flexor tendon sheath, the palmar plate, the collateral ligaments of the MP joint, the extensor mechanism, and the palmar aponeurosis. Now we'll move on to look at the muscles of the hand. We'll begin by looking at the extrinsic muscles, the long muscles of the hand which lie in the forearm. Then we'll move on to look at the intrinsic muscles, the short muscles that lie in the hand. Starting with the extrinsic muscles then, we'll look first at the flexors of the fingers, then at the extensors of the fingers, and lastly we'll look at the four long muscles of the thumb. Flexion of the fingers is produced by two long muscles, flexor digitorum profundus and flexor digitorum superficialis. Here's the deep finger flexor, flexor digitorum profundus. It arises from the anterior and medial surface of the ulna and from the interosseous membrane. Here are its four tendons entering the carpal tunnel. We'll follow them in a minute. This adjoining muscle we'll see later on. It's flexor pollicis longus, the long thumb flexor. Now let's add the superficial finger flexor, flexor digitorum superficialis, to the picture. Here it is. It lies right on top of the profundus. It has two heads of origin, a radial head and a humero-ulnar head. The humero-ulnar head arises as part of the common flexor tendon from the medial epicondyle of the humerus and also from the adjoining ulna. Its radial head arises from this long oblique line on the radius.
Between the two heads, there's a gap which the median nerve and the ulnar artery both pass through. The four separate tendons of flexor digitorum superficialis are bundled together as they enter the carpal tunnel. Before we follow the superficialis and profundus tendons into the hand, we'll bring the forearm to the upright position. As the flexor tendons pass through the carpal tunnel, they're all enfolded within this common synovial sheath, which extends into the palm of the hand. Just as the flexor tendons emerge from the carpal tunnel, the four profundus tendons give rise to these four intrinsic muscles, the lumbricals. We'll be looking at these later. For now, we'll remove them to simplify the picture. Just before reaching the MP joint, the superficialis and profundus tendons of each finger enter the flexor tendon sheath together. To follow them, we'll remove the sheath. Over the proximal phalanx, the superficialis tendon splits into two halves, which pass around the profundus tendon. We'll remove the profundus tendon for a moment. The two halves of the superficialis tendon reunite, and as they do so, they insert here, on the middle phalanx. The profundus tendon, here it is back in place, emerges between the two halves of superficialis and continues distally to insert here, on the base of the distal phalanx. The action of flexor digitorum superficialis is to flex the proximal IP joint and the MP joint. The action of flexor digitorum profundus is to flex both the IP joints and the MP joint. Now let's look at the muscles that extend the fingers. There are three, a large one that extends all four fingers and two small ones for the index and little fingers. The large one is extensor digitorum, sometimes called extensor digitorum communis. It arises from the common extensor tendon and thereby from the lateral epicondyle. As it passes distally, it divides into four slips, which pass together under the extensor retinaculum. We'll follow them beyond there in a minute. The extensor muscle to the little finger, extensor digiti minimi, arises from the ulnar side of extensor digitorum and passes under the retinaculum by itself. The extensor muscle to the index finger, extensor indices, lies deep to extensor digitorum. It arises from the ulna and the interosseous membrane. Its tendon passes under the retinaculum along with extensor digitorum. Emerging from beneath the extensor retinaculum, the extensor tendons fan out. As they approach the MP joints, they branch and rejoin in an irregular fashion. Extensor indices and extensor digiti minimi join the respective extensor digitorum tendons as they reach the MP joint. Here at the MP joint, each extensor tendon gives rise to the extensor hood, then divides into three parts, as we saw when we looked at the extensor mechanism a little while back. The extensor muscles produce extension at all three joints of the finger. Their main effect is at the MP joint. As we'll see later, the interosseous muscles and the lumbricals also have major roles in extending the interphalangeal joints. Now let's move on to look at the long muscles of the thumb. The thumb has a long flexor, a long abductor, and two extensors, a long one and a short one. The long flexor Flexor pollicis longus lies deep in the forearm. We'll remove flexor digitorum superficialis to see it. Here's flexor pollicis longus lying alongside flexor digitorum profundus. It arises from the anterior surface of the radius and from the interosseous membrane. Its tendon passes through the carpal tunnel with the finger flexors. Here's the tendon of flexor pollicis longus emerging. It enters the fibrous flexor sheath of the thumb and inserts on the base of the distal phalanx. Flexor pollicis longus flexes both the MP joint and the IP joint of the thumb. The other three long thumb muscles lie on the extensor aspect of the forearm. They lie deep to extensor digitorum, 
which we'll remove. This is the long abductor, abductor pollicis longus. And these are the extensors, extensor pollicis previs and longus. The abductor arises from the radius here and also from the interosseous membrane. The two extensors arise a little more distally, the short one here, the long one here. Now we'll put extensor digitorum back in the picture. Here it is. The three thumb muscles emerge obliquely from the back of the thumb and part of the back of the index. The deep branch of the radial nerve, also known as the posterior interosseous nerve, is a motor nerve. It passes through the supinator and emerges here, deep to extensor digitorum. It breaks up into several branches. Between them, these supply extensor carpi ulnaris, extensor digitorum, and the other two finger extensors, and these three long thumb muscles, abductor pollicis longus, and extensor pollicis brevis and longus. Now let's look at the median nerve. Let's go back to the elbow where we saw it in the last section. Here's the median nerve next to the brachial artery. To see where it's going, we'll retract flexor carpi radialis. The median nerve first dives between the two heads of pronator teres. It then immediately passes between the two heads of flexor digitorum superficialis. The median nerve, here it is, passes down the forearm between flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus. It emerges at the wrist to the radial side of the superficialis tendons. It's crossed by the tendons of palmaris longus and flexor carpi radialis. The median nerve passes through the carpal tunnel to reach the hand. It lies just beneath the palmar aponeurosis, which has been removed here. The median nerve gives off this small motor branch to the thenar muscles and then gives off these three common digital nerves. The common digital nerves break up into palmar digital nerves, two each for the thumb, index, and middle fingers, and usually one for the radial side of the ring finger. The medial nerve typically provides sensation to the medial half of the palm, the flexor aspect of the thumb, the index and middle fingers, and the radial side of the ring finger. Of the extrinsic hand muscles, the median nerve supplies flexor digitorum superficialis, flexor pollicis longus, and the radial half of flexor digitorum profundus. Of the intrinsic hand muscles, it supplies only the three thenar muscles and the radial two lumbricals. Lastly, let's look at the ulna nerve. As you'll recall from the last section, the ulna nerve enters the forearm by passing round the medial epicondyle and between the two heads of flexor carpi ulnaris. Here's the ulna nerve. It runs down the forearm between flexor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum superficialis with profundus deep to it. Here, it gives off a dorsal sensory branch, which goes to the back of the hand. At the wrist, it runs along the radial side of flexor carpi ulnaris. Along with the ulnar artery, it passes through the side tunnel in the edge of the flexor retinaculum. Here it is emerging from the tunnel. As before, the palmar aponeurosis has been removed. The ulnar nerve divides into a superficial branch and a deep branch. The superficial branch divides into palmar digital nerves for the little finger and typically the ulnar side of the ring finger. The deep branch passes between the hypothenar muscles. To follow it, we'll remove the flexor tendons. The deep branch of the ulnar nerve runs across the palm in front of the interossei. It passes in between the two heads of adductor pollicis. We'll remove the transverse head to reach the most radial of the interossei. The ulnar nerve typically provides sensation to the ulnar half of the back and the front of the hand, and to the little finger and the ulnar half of the ring finger. 
Of the extrinsic hand muscles, the ulnar nerve supplies only the ulnar half of the flexor digitorum profundus. Of the intrinsic hand muscles, it supplies the hypothenar muscles, all the interossei, adductor pollicis, and the ulnar two lumbricals. Before we move on to look at the skin of the hand, let's briefly review what we've seen of the vessels and nerves. Here's the cephalic vein, the basilic vein, and the antecubital vein. Here's the radial artery in the forearm and at the wrist. The ulnar artery in the forearm and at the wrist the superficial palmar arch, common digital arteries and digital arteries, and the deep palmar arch. Here's the radial nerve with its deep branch and its superficial branch. Here's the median nerve in the forearm and at the wrist with its motor branch, the common digital nerves and digital nerves. Here's the ulnar nerve in the forearm. Here's its dorsal sensory branch. Here's the ulnar nerve at the wrist with its superficial branch and its deep branch. Here's the distribution of the radial nerve, the median nerve, and the ulnar nerve. Last of all, we'll take a look at the skin of the hand and at the fingernails. On the back of the hand, the skin is thin and freely movable. This underlying layer of loose areolar tissue enables the skin to move. When the wrist and the MP joints are extended, the skin is loose and redundant. When they're flexed, it becomes tight. By contrast, the skin on the front of the hand is quite thick and much less movable. It's fixed to the underlying palmar aponeurosis by many strands of tough fibrous tissue. The creases on the palmar skin are lines along which the skin is thinner. The creases act as joints in the skin when the MP joints flex. It's easy to see where the MP joints are when we look at the back of the hand, but because of the way the skin slopes forward in between the bases of the fingers, the position of the MP joints can be a surprise when we're looking from the front of the hand. The MP joints aren't here, they're right back here, in line with the distal palmar skin crease. So fully half the length of the proximal phalanx of each finger lies beneath the skin of the palm. On the fingers, as in the hand, the skin is thin and extensible on the back, thick and deeply creased on the front. Let's take a close look at the specialized skin of the fingertip. The skin of the fingertip contains huge numbers of sensory nerve endings. The pulp of the fingertip is composed of fat interlaced with many fibrous strands which anchor the skin to the distal phalanx. The fingernail is a hard plate of keratin that's produced by the specialized epithelial cells which lie beneath its base, here, 
a fold of skin overlaps the edge of the nail and adheres to it closely. We'll remove the skin on one side to see the full extent of the nail. Here's its edge. And we'll take away one half of the nail to see the underlying nail bed or nail matrix. Finally, we'll remove part of the nail bed. Here's the cut edge of the nail bed. It's closely adherent to the underlying distal phalanx. The actual nail forming tissue is just here. It's the nail forming tissue that produces this pale area, the lunula, that's visible at the base of many people's nails. That brings us to the end of this tape on the upper extremity. The remaining tapes of the video atlas will be the lower extremity, the trunk, the organs of the thorax and abdomen, and the head and neck.